I think we're good to start then, Owen. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for Hi. joining. Mm -hmm. Thanks for joining. Uh, this is the second in, a, in our series of More in Memories, uh, Places from the Past talk talks that are sponsored by Tullymore United Football Club and funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund. Um, tonight, we've got Owen Halpin, who's going to be covering the topic of fire, ice and people. Um, just before we get started and before I hand over to Owen, uh, a couple of housekeeping things. If, if anyone has any questions along the way, we're going to try and save them up to the end and have a question and answer session at the end. So if you want to, um, you can type your question into the chat window um, or feel free to leave it to the end and you can unmute yourself and ask the question one-to-one um, -one with Owen. Um, uh, everybody's on mute, I think, at the minute. If, if anybody comes off mute, I may mute them just to make sure that there's no background noise. So uh, just bear, bear that in mind. Um, otherwise, I think we're good to go. And I'll hand over to Owen to get us kicked off. You want to share your desktop there, Owen? There we go. Are we good to go there, Aiden? Yeah, you can see me? I'm going to see the screen. Um, yes, I think so. My screen's gone, but can everybody see Owen's yes, desktop? We can see... Yeah, great. There we go. Yeah. Right. Yes. All right. Yes. Fantastic. Well, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I, see, I presume there's ladies and gentlemen out there. It's, <laughs> it's very strange. Uh, uh, obviously, I was just saying to Aidan there that uh, it's very difficult to give uh, lectures when you don't have that uh, immediate personal reaction. And reading the crowd, as I say, the gentleman snoring in the back, the back seat of the auditorium. <laughs> Anyway, be that as it may. So um, really what I'm, I'm, what I'm going to give a talk, and it'll be fairly sort of um, free and easy talk about, um, I suppose, the origins of uh, this wonderful landscape in which we are blessed to live, uh, the Morns and Schlieve Krug and that sort of area, um, how it was formed, um, the sort of forces that were at play in the formation of it. And then to go on a bit and talk about the, uh, the introduction of man into that landscape, uh, when he got here or she got here or they got here. And, uh, and then what effect that they had uh, on the landscape. <clears throat> and then the reintroduction or the introduction again then of the uh, first farmers. I'm not going to take it right through to the Bronze Age and the Iron Age and up to the early Christian period, etc. I thought I'd stop at, at the Neolithic because there's, there'll be plenty of stuff to talk about um, in that. Oh, hang on. Something wrong there now. Oh, there we go. So, as you may have all been aware over the last, and it's very interesting when I give these, when I give these talks, um, I look around the world and um, I see loads of physical um, events that remind me of uh, the world on which we live. And I just put up um, three of them, uh, just as a matter of, of interest, really. One was a local um, earthquake in Japan, which I think measured three or four on the Richter scale, which caused some serious damage um, to Japan and the area around Tokyo. The bottom one then I'm sure you're aware of is, is the recent eruption in, uh, in Iceland where a volcano that had been um, dormant for some 900 years suddenly sprang into life and started to spew lava over much of the area around Reykjavik. And then our good and faithful friend Mount Etna um, in Italy uh, on the island of Sicily um, is again becoming very active. And it all reminded me of the sort of the, the, the volatile nature of, of the earth and various movements and uh, eruptions that can take place over time. So this is the world as we know it. Uh, we're all very familiar with it. Um, <clears throat> but the most interesting thing, I think that, that, that people uh, need to get their head around when 
we're talking about the world as in as today is that it's it's fluid it's by no means a stable situation that we're living in and from the very beginning as soon as almost as soon as magellan sailed around the world um in the earliest days and he started to map the coast of africa and he started to map the coast of south america it was remarked uh, even back in the 16th 17th century that it looked awfully like uh, south america would fit into the side of africa uh, and that north america would fit neatly into the side of europe and that led to people postulating that maybe what they were looking at on the ground, so to speak, wasn't necessarily what had always been there. And that really was that those theories were thrown around for many years uh, as, the, as early geologists started to ponder these, these uh, uh, matters. And it was fairly rubbished uh, by on the basis that nice idea lads but you know planets earth doesn't move the way the way the the the, the planet the, the way the ground the way the continents are placed sure how can they move there's no mechanism for 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 events like that to to um to take place um and therefore it was deemed to be uh the hypothesis that that the, the, the land masses move was uh, poo-pooed. However, geology came sort of to the rescue, I suppose, and geologists working, uh, oddly enough, in Scotland first, and then subsequently in Donegal in Ireland, uh, they started to chart the, the geological features running from uh, Donegal right through to the glens of Scotland, the, the glen, um, uh, the the uh, Loch Ness glens and the, the Loch Ness uh, in Scotland and began to see a pattern of rocks um, almost like a, a, a bar chart that you see in in, in, um, in shops you know lines running along the landscape and then and then similarly a geologist working in Newfoundland in um, in Canada noticed exactly the same uh, sequence of rocks appearing in, in the geology of um, uh, in Newfoundland. Remarkably similar, so much so that you, they could match up the sequence in Newfoundland and they could match up the sequence in Scotland. And then some paleo uh, ecologists working in uh, West Africa came across quite unique fossils uh, in the rocks in West Africa and then at the same time uh, paleo e e ecologists working in Brazil on the coast of Brazil came across exactly the same type of fossils in the rocks in Brazil and again the sequence that they saw of the of the deposition of the rocks in Brazil were exactly the same as the deposition of the rocks in West Africa it was impossible to ignore that level of, of parallelism between what was happening in Africa, what was happening in, in, in South America, and particularly the detail of the rocks information coming from Scotland and coming from Newfoundland. So work started on trying to figure out what the mechanisms might be that, that could form that. And oddly enough, in work that carried out primarily in uh, laying down uh, subsea cables, um, uh, te telegraph cables across the Atlantic, uh, work on that discovered this, what they now call the, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which is a line effectively of mountains running right down the middle of the Atlantic between um, uh, Europe on one side and America, and it runs right down, as you can see on the, on the, on the and my, my cursor now is running across, there's the Mid-Atlantic Ridge running down 
uh, between um, America and Africa and between Europe and Europe and America. And that ridge was discovered when they were laying, doing oceanography along the, the sea floor. And they reckoned that, that this ridge was formed by uh, lava spewing out under the sea. <clears throat> and that was a eureka moment for, uh, for this, this, the study of, of what, what became known as plate tectonics where suddenly they now had a mechanism. And down in the bottom left-hand corner uh, of the, the, the slide, you can see hot magma wells, wells up from the, from the core and it spews out sideways, going to the left and the right, and it pushes the crust apart. Um, and that happens, that is happening all the way down that mid-Atlantic ridge. It's happening all the way down all of those ridges that you can see there is that constant movement of land, of, of magma coming out of the Earth's core and pushing the land sideways. Indeed, such is the, such is the rate of that happening that, that we here in Ireland are moving apart from America by about a centimetre a year. Uh, and that's not the quickest. Australia is moving north at three times that speed. So all of these divisions that you can see running around the, the globe are all effectively uh, what they're now calling plate tectonics. So each of the land masses are sitting on top of plates that are constantly shifting and moving. And these are the plates. These are the plates effectively that dot all over the world. So you have the massive Eurasian plate on which we sit, you have the North American plate, you have the South American plate, and you have the Australian plate and the African plate, there are smaller plates in between. But all those lines that you see running around all over the world, that's where the plates meet. So, and when I say meet, that's where they bump into one another. And I've highlighted the three spots that I talked about at the beginning of the talk. So we have Japan over here. Japan is sitting on the Eurasian plate, but it's getting bumped into by this, the major Pacific plate. And as that plate moves westwards and bumps into the Eurasian plate, it causes earthquakes. Up here in Reykjavik, in the top here, up by Iceland, this is where gr the ground is spewing out magma out of the soil or out of the ground and every so often it hits the surface and creates a volcano and that's why you're getting volcanoes in um, uh, in in Iceland and similarly the African plate is moving north and hitting against the Eurasian plate and it's causing stress and that's the reason why Etna is, um, is spewing volcanoes at the moment. But also in red, I've dotted around various mountain ranges uh, around the map. And so where the Indian plate is bumping against the Eurasian plate, the two plates meet and at the edge it crumples and it creates mountains. And so we get uh, mountain formation in the Himalayas, again, where the African plate bumps into the, the Eurasian plate, we get the Alps on one side and the Atlas Mountains on another. And down in, down in South America, it's the same. You get the formation of the Andes where one plate is bumping into another and the Rockies are the same. So all around the world, we're getting this constant movement of plates moving back and forth, shifting their positions across the globe. And that led a uh, geologist to say, well, if this is what it looks like today, down here in the bottom left-hand corner, and we know these monuments, the, these plates are shifting, can we go backwards in time and try and figure out where these plates were in the past? And through a series of uh, work on, on the stones and on, on rocks and on, on various uh, formations of magnets and, and the, the subtle positions of rocks against north and true north, 
they've managed to figure out that uh, 10 million years ago in the Cretaceous period, this is what the world looked like. And when the dinosaurs were running around in Jurassic, the Jurassic era, the middle, the middle uh, on the left there, that's what the world looked like. That was what the landmass looked like. And then again, going back 45 million years ago, you have in the Silurian epoch, you have the 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 the, the accumulation of small, relatively small islands with large man masses at the base, and then 600 million years ago. Every single bit of the ground was covered in a single, a single what they call a, a mag, mega continent. And the thing about this is, it's continuing. It's continuing on uh, time and time and time. So in another, not that it'll worry anybody to listen to this talk, but in another, another 10, 50 billion years ago, this won't be recognizable. The world will have shifted and moved on. And what has that got to do with us, you might ask? Well, this, in this period here, in the Silurian period, this huge ocean called the Iapetus Ocean um, spread apart, uh, filled in with water, and then over time, that ocean shrunk as the two continents on either side met. And what's absolutely fascinating, as far as I'm concerned, is that those two continents met along that red line that you can see running down that graphic. So the southern half of Ireland was on one continent. So it's the equivalent of one part of Ireland originally being in somewhere like uh, Africa and the other being in America. And the, the two sides of the Atlantic closing and meeting up. So the southern part of Ireland was originally down around where the Antarctic is, and the northern part of Ireland was somewhere where America is today, divided by an ocean called the Iapetus Ocean. And over many millions of years, that ocean, um, those two land masses came together and formed what effectively is now the land mass on which Ireland exists. And that line can still be traced today in a line, you can still see that jun junction um, just south of um, Carlingford, and it runs in a diagonal line out through the Shannon Estuary. And the Shannon Estuary is actually formed on, on that fault line. That's the reason why the Shannon um, Estuary exists today, because that's the fault line that ultimately got flooded in, in, in more recent times. But the most interesting thing from our point of view is that all of the seabed that used to exist in the Iapetus Ocean got spewed out onto the ground. It got squelched together, as you can see down here in this bottom drawing down the bottom right hand side, as the two plates came together, the sea floor as it was spread out over the land. Um, creating a, a, a new rock layer across much of Ireland. And it was interestingly enough, when those two, um, when those two land masses came together, the force of that created an underground um, eruption. And that underground eruption happened 400 million years ago, and it created Schlieve Krug, which is the mountain just outside my window. So 400 million years ago, two land masses crunched together. They created such stress underneath that, that molten rock was forced up from the core, from the Earth's core. It created a dome, it cooled down, and Schlieve Krug is the, um, is the, the result. Mind boggling. So now we have a situation where We've got a big landmass covered in this, what they call Silurian rock. And because the situation uh, continues, because the earth continues to move, continues to, the, the plates continue to shift around, those two landmasses started to move apart again to create the Atlantic Ocean. 
And that started to happen about 100 million years ago. So here in the right hand, the, the left hand picture, top left hand picture, this is how close Ireland and Newfoundland was about 100 million years ago. And that's where you can see the rocks that used to be in, in or that, that currently are in Scotland and Northern Ireland, that line runs all the way down into Newfoundland. And that's the reason why we can get these rocks <clears throat> appearing both in Scotland and in Newfoundland, because originally they were right together. They were formed at the same time, um, and then they split uh, 100 million years ago. But the split that occurred 100 million years ago caused huge tension on this area. And one of the areas that, that uh, it caused tension was the Morns. Um, that tension underneath this Silurian rock that we can see here, this big crust that had, that had formed over the area, when the two land masses started to pull apart, the, the shale buckled underneath the ground and a cavity was formed. And into that cavity, a series of molten rock pushed. And you can see them running along the bottom over time, perhaps maybe uh, uh, 10, 15 million years apart, a series of what they call volcanic intrusions happened underneath the ground. This wasn't on the surface, this was under the, under the ground and, the, and the, 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 the molten rock cooled underground and cooled into granite. And so this is, this is the, the top picture is those series of granite intrusions um, eroded away to form, so that the rock that, we, that used to sit on top has been eroded away, it's softer rock, and it reveals the harder granite underneath. And that's now, so the ridge that you can see running right the way across from Sleep Donard, all the way across to the Leitrim Valley and beyond running along the bottom, are, is the old volcanic intrusions and the old weathering of, of the rock to reveal the Morn Mountains. So the Morn Mountains are in fact a product of volcanic er eruptions that happened about 63 million, 64 million years ago when the, when the, two, earth, the two movements of the two continents start to move apart to create what we now know as the Atlantic Ocean. But that wasn't the end of the story because ultimately what we see today is not only a product of geology, but also a product of ice. And we have in Ireland two major uh, ice ages, one called the Munsterian, and it's named the Munsterian because it spread down, it spread over the whole of Ireland, right down across Munster. And then the second one is a Midlandian. And both of those are very important from the point of view of the development of the Morns and the current Morn landscape. <clears throat> and up here, top left, this line is the line of the, the ice at its greatest extent, running all the way along out into the, out into the Atlantic Ocean and all the way down around the bottom of Ireland, all the way across most of England. So that was all covered with ice somewhere in the region of a kilometre thick. <clears throat> and then the second, in, the second, the second um, uh, ice uh, age, um, the Midlandian, it was the one that did most of the damage, so to speak, around the Morns, causing massive amounts of, of erosion and deposition around the Morns landscape. <clears throat> And so what we see today in particularly along the, the, the Anlong Valley and the Silent Valley and all the various valleys that now puncture the Morns are all a product of this last glaciation period where massive amounts of, of glaciers uh, formed in the high Morns and pushed their way down, eroded these long big valleys that we see today, these fantastically picturesque Anlong Valley, the Bloody Bridge Valley, and uh, the Silent Valley, they were all created by this last glaciation some 10 to 13,000 years ago. <clears throat> but as these, as the ice moved back, um, it created what they call 
so the weight of the the weight of the 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 ice the ice sheets forced the ice forced the land down just by the sheer weight of the quantity of ice that was sitting on top of it and as the ice uh, eroded or uh, melted backwards there was a massive release of pressure a bit like if you can imagine putting your hand uh, on a on a on a on a lump of timber floating in the in the in, in a bowl of water, you take your hand off and the, the the log bounces back up again. That's exactly what happened with the land, albeit over time. And so we get these raised beaches running along the coast of County Down, and um, particularly a bloody bridge. But these these are a series of of the uh, of the raised beaches running along the uh, the road down to uh, Kilkeel from Bloody Bridge. The road itself is sitting along what was the, the seashore uh, at the end of the last ice age, um, but the land has bounced back up and a new seashore has been formed 10, 15 metres below. And that's happening all the way along the, 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 the county down coast. But that in itself has huge implications because we tend to think of Ireland as, Ireland as an island. But in fact, that's not the case, and it certainly wasn't the case in the past 10, 15,000 years. In fact, over there on the left hand side, you can see a really nice graphic of um, the landscape as it would have been. Um, the green, the lighter green, is what the landscape would have looked like around 10 to 15,000 years ago. Ireland and England were not islands. In fact, you could walk, you could have happily walked from France through England and Ireland and out maybe five or six miles out beyond the current coast of Ireland at that stage. And this is as soon as the ice had melted and uh, has retreated, because although the ice retreated from Ireland, it held a huge amount of water still as it melted further north. And so, and uh, as soon as the ice left, we had massive amounts of land around Ireland. In fact, as I say, Ireland and the UK and the, the Great Britain were not uh, islands at all. But very quickly, sometime around uh, uh, 10,000 years ago, Ireland did become an island. And uh, the channel between Ireland and the UK was created, the centre the center photograph there, or the centre picture there. Uh, and then uh, uh, 10,000 years, or certainly before the uh, arrival of man into Ireland, uh, Ireland, Ireland was, uh, was, was an island. And so where did the people come from and how did they get here? If Ireland, if Ireland was an island uh, nine to 10,000 years ago, man didn't arrive onto Ireland, onto, onto the island of Ireland until about 8,000 years ago. Um, there was quite clearly a, a, a continuous channel running all the way down the, uh, the, what we know as the Irish Sea. Um, and so how did they get here? Um, the obvious, uh, the obvious uh, uh, answer to that is they came by boat of some description. Um, and the possible routes uh, would have been through Scotland, uh, across into, into Antrim, uh, from Wales across into the south of Ireland, and possibly the most likely one really is across uh, via the Isle of Man onto Ireland. However, we must remember that at 8,000 years ago or 9,000 years ago, much of the, the bay, that bay around the Isle of Man would have been probably relatively dry land. And it would have been a relatively small hop, skip and a jump from the edge of, 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 um, of the Isle of Man across into Ireland. The, the archaeological evidence would suggest that there might have been as many as three areas where they came from. The, 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 um, the flint assemblages, as you can see there on the, on the left hand side, the flint assemblages that we get in Ireland um, are similar to the flint assemblages in Scotland, in the Isle of Man and in Wales. So there's a very good chance that they probably didn't come from one particular place but they came from as many as three. And so what evidence do we have around, around County Down for the arrival of man? Well, 
there are two main places. There's there was a, a, a numbers of flints have been found in in Annalong. Um, uh, a, a small excavation was undertaken. A field walking excavation was undertaken down in Annalong, where a series of flints were found uh, indicative of, of late Mesolithic material, uh, and also in in uh, in Dundrum, uh, in Murloc, in the sand hills, some Mesolithic flints were found there. The the the, the, the main trouble with, with, with Mesolithic man or Mesolithic peoples were they were um, hunter-gatherers, they were relatively uh, mobile, and they didn't leave huge footprints, so to speak, in the archaeological record. Um, they tended to live in fairly flimsy circular huts, maybe uh, 8 to 10 metres in diameter. Um, the, the best example known to Maryland is up in County uh, Londonderry, up in Derry, just uh, just outside Derry in in um, in Mount Sandal, um, or sorry, outside Coleraine, Mount Sandal, and uh, you can see there the sort of the curving line of uh, post holes, uh, creating a a, a circular, uh, relatively temper, re relatively flimsy flimsy structure inside which uh, would have been uh, a hearth for for cooking. But the other interesting thing about the fact that Ireland was an island prior to the arrival of man was that there, it was fairly poor in uh, large uh, animals with which uh, early man could have eaten. Um, and so you can see from these two tables, there, I won't go into them in any detail, but you can readily see that um, uh, in large mammals, were land mammals, shall I say, and, and fish were by far the greatest. And fish was, was one of the major um, uh, uh, um, um, food sources. But of the large ma mammals, pig was by far the greatest. And that's, that's probably because they now reckon that the, the, the earliest uh, animals like the pigs and stuff were actually brought in by Mesolithic man onto Ireland. Ireland. The larger animals didn't make it themselves. They, they, so in England, you would have had the big, the, the big deers, the ox, the, uh, those sort of animals. They never made it as far as Ireland. And so they were limited. Probably they brought over, Mesolithic peoples brought over pigs with them as they traveled uh, from, um, from Britain across to Ireland. And though this is sort of a, a, a representation, a drawing of, of Mesolithic uh, a possible Mesolithic settlement. You can see again the the flimsy huts that that they would have used. They would have been these are the sort of boats, um, you, fishing, uh, um, and uh, 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 but but very much temporary, very much seasonal, moving with the resources. But the most interesting thing, I suppose, is that they reckon that that the the population of Ireland at that stage would wouldn't have been many more than about uh, three thousand people. So. Um, the fact that a there was very few people living on on the island, and b they lived in 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 very uh, temporary structures, very flimsy structures, means that their archaeological record, the archaeological footprint, isn't particularly strong. But one of the major events that took place happened around uh, four thousand uh, um, BC, about six thousand years ago, and that was the introduction of the Neolithic into Ireland. And the Neolithic was absolutely fundamentally huge as far as um, uh, Ireland, Ireland and the way of life. It brought changes in, in diet uh, because it heralded the start of uh, agriculture. And you can see this graphic showing the, the sort of the, the, the movement of, of agriculture across Europe starting around nine and a half thousand years, and then moving across and getting to Ireland about 6,000, so that's 4,000 BC. Um, so bringing, bringing agriculture with it. They also changed in, in, in the houses. They were, they were sedentary. They brought agriculture, they were sedentary. The material culture was different. They brought pots, a different type of stone uh, um, assemblage as well. But perhaps the most important, as, because it was, it's the best represented in the Irish archeological record, is the burial practices, and really, we're only for our for our for, for, for the purpose of this lecture, we're only interested in the top three here: the portal tombs, the core tombs, and the passage tombs. 
and you can see that the portal tombs and the court tombs around three and a half thousand BC up to around three two two eight two nine that was the sort of uh, period in which Neolithic the Neolithic took place um, and there the they, these are the monuments that are best rent, best represented in the Morn landscape and so you can see there are the the, the 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 various stone monuments that we have cairn chamber tombs portal tombs court tombs etc but as you well know or some of you may well know <clears throat> we have a fair smattering of these monuments scattered all around the morns around the fringes of the morns particularly down the south end down around um uh, ross trevor and around kilkeel and um uh, greencastle uh, but also up around uh, ourselves up here, uh, Wateresk and uh, um, uh, around uh, Goward, etc. So around the fringes of the Morns. Um, you may ask, and I'm anticipating a question, um, was there anybody physically living within the Morns? Uh, in other words, were they living in around the Morns and up the valleys? The answer to that is possibly yes. However, with the introduction or the development of peat over ma many of the, 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 the valleys in the Bronze Age um, and later, um, evidence for all of that material may in fact be buried under peat, a bit like the cage of fields in, in the west of Ireland, where you have entire field systems buried under bogs. It's entirely possible that underneath some or many parts of the interior of the Morns, which are now peat covered, may actually have evidence for uh, uh, archaeology. And so these are the fantastically well-preserved monuments, the portal tombs or portal dolmens that we have around, around the, the Morns. Um, very nice uh, Leganeni dolmen up by me, up here in, 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 in Schlieve Crew, but you have uh, uh, Slitteryford down there, uh, close to Dundrum and then the Ross Trevor Monument and, and the Goward Dolmen. Um, fantastic monuments, um, but probably monuments that, that uh, were as impressive today as they were um, back when they were built. In other words, I don't think they were ever covered in a cairn. I think they were probably as impressive as they are. They were built to be impressive. Uh, cremation was the order of the day by and large, so the cremated remains were buried within the chamber underneath the, the, the capstone. Um, and it's entirely possible that either the chamber was regularly um, uh, cleaned out or that, that only particular parts of a representative selection of, of the population was buried in these monuments. The other ones that we have around uh, are, are the court tombs so named because of the curving facade on, on either end. On end. Um, and, and we have a, a, a fantastic example at Audley's Town where we have a, a, it's a, a dual court cairn, which is one at either end. But these monuments were covered in a cairn. They were um, quite different in terms of um, a dark passage into which um, the bodies and the various parts of the bodies were laid. And um, the idea of going into a dark space to, to, to deposit uh, your dead um, smacks to me anyway of a different set of beliefs than the more open portal tombs, um, where you get this, this, these large open tombs with a capstone on top, whereas this is a deep, dark passage. And archaeologists in the past have got all pet up about going back to the womb and giving birth and um, all of that class of thing. Um, you pays your money and you take your chance there, I'm afraid. But perhaps one of the, one of the, the, the largest monument, and may, although, although uh, uh, quite denuded now, is the one that's actually on top of Sleep Donard itself, smack bang on the, on the highest point of, of, of the Morns. Uh, the Great Cairn up on top of, of, of Sleep Donard. Um, I have to say that I was, uh, the first time I went up there, I mistakenly thought that the, 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 the Great Cairn was the big pile of rocks um, on, top of the, on top of the mountain uh, until I um, uh, did a bit of research and suddenly realized that the, 
the actual cairn itself, uh, the great cairn, the big pile of stones, is just this little small pile of stones that you can see that I'm that I'm showing you there with the cursor. But the actual monument itself is this substantial cairn running much, running to about uh, 20 to 25 meters in diameter. And you can still vaguely see it, even when I take, even when I take away the dotted circle, you can see the edge running around here, the edge of the cairn running around here, the edge of the cairn running around here, all the way around here. And um, <clears throat> a, a very substantial monument it had been until, of course, A, the Morn Wall was built, and B, um, the trigonometry point. Well, the trigonometry point came first, and then the Morn Wall was built. But this is a, 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 a graphic showing what the cairn would look like in, in, uh, in the 19th century. And I'm fairly convinced that uh, the well that they talk about is probably a collapsed chamber and that the seat that they talk about in the descriptions is probably part of a, a lintel of the passage. And um, the, uh, I, I put up a graphic there showing the um, the Schlieve Gullion Passage Tomb, um, which is fairly well preserved by comparison, uh, but the chamber itself is similar in, in size to, I suspect, what would have been the, the cairn of the chamber on, on the Donard, and uh, the, the, the lintel stones are probably the seat that they talk about in the, in, in the, 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 the passage tomb on top of uh, Donard. So, in summary, I suppose we have we have a, a major cultural event happening in the Morns of uh, about three three thousand eight hundred years ago when these these new peoples and I think they were new peoples. Uh, I don't think that that the Mesolithic people developed into Neolithic people. I think, um, the, at best, the Mesolithic people were subsumed by uh, the Neolithic peoples. But it, it is beyond doubt that uh, the Neolithic was not brought, it wasn't an idea that was brought to Ireland, it was people that brought that idea. Uh, people with a different set of cultural beliefs, uh, they buried their dead in, in, in megalithic tombs, um, as big as the, your new granges, but also your dolmens and your, your portal tombs and your court tombs. Um, they brought agriculture with them. Uh, which was a way of domesticating both animals. So they brought their own animals with them. They brought sheep, they brought pigs, they brought goats, uh, they brought cattle. Um, they divided the landscape into fields. They regularized the landscape and they lived in permanent settlements. Um, these large rectangular huts, uh, houses indeed, they're not huts, um, some as many as 15 to 20 meters long, uh, five meters wide, um, made of substantial timbers very permanent, very, very well uh, organized. And they, they came, those people came probably from across the Irish Sea, uh, possibly from, uh, from Scotland. But interestingly enough, uh, increasingly, we're beginning to see a, a, a sea route coming in from Northern France, uh, a land or a bridge, uh, a, sea, a sea bridge or sea route between Brittany and um, uh, south coast and the west coast of Ireland. Um, and interestingly enough, one of the earliest dates that we're getting for a portal tomb uh, is from um, Pool Nebron. Uh, and the Pool Nebron dates are coming out at very early Neolithic, almost late Mesolithic. So that's a very early monument, a very early Neolithic monument uh, at a date when effectively um, there was no way that they, they landed on the east coast and moved west. Poole Nebron would suggest that the people who built Poole Nebron landed on the west coast of Ireland, um, all probably directly from um, Britain. And the other, the, the, the final, the final, final, final thing I want to talk about a bit is, is DNA. I'm sure you've all heard about DNA and, and its uses, but you're now using uh, DNA in archaeology to uh, I suppose really to try and firm up some of the uh, some of the theories and some of the uh, roots and movements of peoples getting into Ireland. And although this is quite old now, this 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 graphic, I think it it it's, it smacks of really interesting uh, ideas. The use of DNA. Um, this lower one 
this lower one, uh, these two here, uh, this this was done on a on a on a population in Mayo. This this DNA, uh, uh, it's a fairly early DNA study done on a population of of, of um, uh, in the, uh, in Mayo. And what the what that DNA uh, results seemed to suggest was that there were a series of um, impulses or pulses of people into Ireland. Um, the earliest being this Mesolithic pulse, the hunter gatherers coming up uh, through England, through Wales, and into into Ireland. And then you have the two uh, uh, Neolithic pulses of people. One potentially. Um, uh, coming across into Ireland uh, on the east, and then this one coming through Brittany up into Ireland on a more westerly line. And then you get later on, you get your Bronze Age coming in to Ireland, and then the Viking trade coming in from the north. All of this showing up as uh, in, in the DNA record. Um, a, fan, a, fa a, fa a fascinating tool. It's a tool that, that, that archaeology is still coming to grips with, and it's becoming more and more refined. Um, as time goes on. And uh, that's it. Uh, thank you very much for listening. It's about uh, a quarter past eight. And um, so uh, if there are any questions, uh, Aidan, uh, happy to take them or, or not, as the case may be.